Hello, everybody. Uh, this is attorneys Adam Frankler and Joseph Shepard, and uh, we are bringing to you this afternoon this webinar that we've entitled "Getting Them Out While Getting Them In While They're Out: Immigration Options for LGBT Foreign Nationals and Their Families." Uh, this is a bi-coastal presentation. I'm located in sunny, or mostly sunny, New York, and my colleague um, Joseph Shepard is located in what I'm sure is a very sunny Los Angeles. Um, we'll be going. We'll be doing a short uh, presentation. Um, this is a rehash of a presentation that we've done earlier, so apologies for people who are joining us for the second time. But we um, have reserved a lot of time for, so that we can get to your questions, because we know that um, the overview is only helpful in its generality, and everyone is looking for specificity. So we have reserved a lot of time for uh, questions, but that does mean we are going to hustle a bit through this presentation. So please bear with us. We have buried some of your uh, questions that you've sent prior to uh, today's webinar to us uh, within this presentation, and then we will get to all of your questions um, that we can um, at the end of the presentation. So thanks again for joining us, and uh, forward we go. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us for this webinar. Um, thank you, Adam, for that wonderful intro for the entire presentation. Like you said, we're going to handle some questions at the end with a little bit more emphasis on the questions than the actual presentation this time around, given the, um, you know, the ever-changing landscape and the imminent decisions coming out from the Supreme Court. Um, so here we go. Let's first start with how marriages are viewed under current immigration law. Um, for married couples, and this is not in the context of same-sex marriages. So marriage recognition under immigration law depends on whether or not it was valid in the jurisdiction where it was performed. So the law of the place of celebration is the controlling law. As long as the marriage was not entered into in bad faith, meaning it was not entered into uh, for the purpose of obtaining immigration benefits, and it was not contrary to public policy in the state where the couple resides in the U.S. or intends to reside in the U.S. Um, uh, we'll get into much more detail about the types of public policy which would be uh, strong enough to make the U.S. Immigration Service not recognize the marriage, but uh, in general, that's the law, and that's where we think the law will go back to. Uh, absent DOMA. So same-sex marriage recognition under federal immigration law uh, would be the same as opposite-sex marriage recognition, but for DOMA. DOMA is the Defense of Marriage Act. It was uh, passed in 1997 and signed into law by former President Bill Clinton, and it divides marriage as between one man and one woman for excuse me, for federal purposes, and defines spouse as either a husband or wife of the opposite sex explicitly, uh, everywhere mentioned in federal law. This is um, the biggest problem for immigration because it now adds a separate definition to the word spouse, which otherwise wasn't there in the Immigration and Nationality Act. Um, therefore, with DOMA still in place, uh, Opposite-sex married couples are unable to sponsor each other for immigration benefits, and um, same-sex couples are unable to um, obtain the same types of derivative classifications they otherwise would, uh, but for DOMA. Now, with DOMA in place, there are special considerations uh, for different groups that have to be taken into consideration that otherwise wouldn't be that large of an issue. Um, recently, the USCIS has issued a policy memo confirming that uh, for marriages between individuals where one spouse is transgender and has completed the transition, uh, that means under that policy memo that the, that the person has completed all necessary steps to effectuate the change to the new gender. Um, instead of now requiring under immigration procedure a changed birth certificate or something similar, because um, many countries in the world and many states in the US don't allow that to happen, if you have a letter 
from a medical professional that's done in the proper way, um, confirming that, that they are the doctor for this patient and this person has completed all necessary steps, it's a much less intrusive means by which uh, transgender individuals can establish the, the opposite sex nature of their marriage um, and still obtain a uh, successfully prosecute a I-130 for their marriage to obtain a green card for the other spouse or themselves. Um, so specifically what this memo did was it ended the requirement that um, they had to have a specific type of surgery in order to affirmatively change the, their gender or sex for purposes of immigration. This new policy now allows those individuals to not have to go into detail about what steps actually were taken um, during the transition, which is a lot less intrusive and follows the guidelines already set in place by the Department of State, um, for example, for U.S. citizens to obtain a change of gender on their passport. So, you know, under DOMA, things like this policy memo have to happen, whereas, you know, the hope eventually is, once DOMA is no longer the law of the land, that a marriage, as long as it's valid where performed, and not contrary to public policy and not in bad faith, regardless of the um, the you know sex of the two parties will be able to be recognized for immigration purposes. Now there's several different implications of DOMA besides just this specific um, area for transgender marriages, but in in particular, the ability of individuals to file an I-130 for their spouse or an I-129F, which is the uh, fiancé visa petition for a same-sex spouse is that while you can still file technically, they cannot be approved. And in practice, we have not seen an I-130 approved for a same-sex spouse or an I-129F approved for a same-sex spouse. Um, they're either being denied or in some limited cases, um, they've been either placed on hold or are caught up in appeals, um, basically allowing the case to remain pending until such time as it can be approved. Now that's not saying that every case will be like that. It's a very tricky and very complex situation and, and it depends on the specific case. Um, in general, we, you know, we do not advise people to file I-130s or I-129Fs for a same-sex spouse. Um, you know, each, each individual case must be really analyzed by a, a competent immigration attorney. And so Anyone considering to do that or having already done that uh, should really speak with an immigration attorney who knows what they're doing in this case. Um, also because of DOMA, you know, there are other implications about having a same-sex spouse, whether it's a uh, binational relationship or a dual foreign national relationship. Uh, when entering the U.S. or when applying for a visa, uh, sometimes this can come up when you're asked, for example, in a, in a visa application on the DS-160, whether or not you have a spouse. Are you married? Well, you may be married in the foreign jurisdiction where you were, you know, where it was performed, but for U.S. immigration purposes because of DOMA, uh, the answer may be more complicated. Um, it also may be more complicated depending on where you're going to live. Um, in particular, therefore, a lot of the DS-160s in jurisdictions where marriage is legal, for all couples. There are additional drop-down items on the question of marital status, you know, married, domestic partner, other, and if there's an other, there's a place for explanation. So there's, a, there's many more complications uh, because of DOMA for, for same-sex married couples than there otherwise would be. In addition, you can never lie whenever you're applying for a visa or, you can, or applying for admission to the United States. So if ever asked by a consular officer, an immigration officer, or a customs and border protection officer um, whether or not you're married and who is this person that you're traveling with or, you know, what is the exact situation, you have to be completely forthcoming. So this can be troubling sometimes for individuals um, who 
perhaps have a, a U.S. citizen spouse in the U.S. or um, otherwise and are unable to obtain the proper immigration paperwork um, in order to come visit them. If they're coming to the U.S. despite that for some other purpose, for example, to go to school or something similar, um, even if their primary purpose is to attend school, if asked by the consular officer or by the Customs and Border Protection officer, they will still have to answer in, in the affirmative, yes, this is my U.S. citizen spouse. Um, and then that opens up the floodgates to more questions of, well, then what's your intent, really? If you're coming here to the U.S. to be with them and stay here and immigrate to the U.S., uh, a student visa is not possible. Well, because of DOMA, it's impossible for me to adjust status. And my primary purpose anyway is to uh, you know, go to school and get this degree and then go back and then you know, maybe one day when DOMA is overturned, uh, be able to come to the U.S. It depends on what your actual situation is, but no matter what, you have to answer truthfully. Um, with the new impending decision on the DOMA case at the Supreme Court, um, this is even more relevant because individuals who may see that as an opportunity to come to the U.S. as a non-immigrant on a specific type of visa that does not allow for dual intent, um, that question may be even more prevalent in the minds of the consular officers should that come up. Um, so I'll, I'll discuss that in slightly more detail in a couple slides, but I just wanted to cover that um, now while it was fresh. Um, other ways that it's, it's implicated is if you're filing an I-140 petition uh, for one of your employees and that employee has a uh, same-sex spouse um, and you report that same-sex spouse on I-140, um, but that same-sex spouse is in some non-immigrant visa category that does not allow for dual intent, that may give, give rise to problems if they are traveling internationally frequently. And um, in addition, for individuals coming with their same-sex spouse um, in, who are in H-1B status or L-1A status or L-1B status, uh, they would otherwise not qualify for the dependent category of H-4 or L-2 or E2 spouse or F2 or O3, they otherwise have to qualify for a B2, uh, which is only valid for usually six months and has to be extended each time, whereas the H4 or L2, for example, would be valid for the period of the principal non-immigrant. Uh, and our job as immigration attorneys uh, is to help individuals um, stay out of removal proceedings. Um, and that's not always possible. So if you do find yourself in removal proceedings, um, there are other ways that having a qualifying relative, um, which is you know often principal, principally a spouse, um, can help you avoid deportation or or removal itself from the United States. Um, we we've listed some of the categories here um, just to cover them briefly: um, asylum derivatives, uh, people who have won asylum either affirmatively, which means not in removal proceedings, or defensively, uh, which means in removal proceedings, are allowed to have their spouses uh, join them in the United States as green card holders, as asylum, uh, as asylees, people who have been granted asylum. And that's not the case for uh, same-sex spouses. Um, VAWA self-petitioners and suspension of deportation is in a bit of flux. Um, cancellation of removal is when you're in uh, removal proceedings and you ask for essentially discretion. Uh, and one of the categories um, weighing in your benefits in terms of the exercise of discretion are U.S. citizen relatives, um, which often includes a spouse, and then certain waivers of inadmissibility, um, unlawful presence, broader misrepresentation, and criminal history. Um, if you do find that you have any of these, um, you know, any of these needs, and you are in removal proceedings, certainly you should contact an immigration attorney, uh, like. Joseph and myself. Um, the, we will also cover some of the waivers to inadmissibility in, labor, in later slides, but um, some of the things that we, that we commonly see are fraud or misrepresentation where somebody has entered on the uh, ESTA program and has failed to disclose a prior criminal history, um, visa overstays, um, which we'll cover um, in greater detail as well, and we know we have a, a question about that from somebody who wrote in to us um, prior to the, um, the presentation, the webinar, and any criminal histories. So those issues um, we'll cover at length, but you should be aware that, um, that, you know, that spouse is a way to 
a U.S. citizen spouse is a way to show positive factors in terms of qualifying for these waivers that are currently, um, you know, bar that same-sex couples are currently barred from using. Um, so uh, let's move on to the next slide. Okay. Um, so this. Um, so essentially, this is just a wrap up of what um, Joseph and I were talking about. But there, um, as as immigration attorneys, we like to keep people in the United States on valid visas. So um, principally, that's going to be a non-immigrant visa. Um, we've covered some of those options um, in the H visa program, the L visa program, uh, student visas or F visa program, and B visas. But those are typical ways that people come to the United States and maintain status in the United States. When they move from non-immigrant status to a more permanent status, where they, uh, um, where they essentially affirm that they'd like to remain in the United States indefinitely, they would um, typically move to what's called an immigrant visa. And uh, shorthand for that is simply a green card. Um, and there are employment-based options and family-based options, as um, my colleague covered in the previous slide. Um, and that's you know, the sort of principal concern of, of this webinar. Um, and so that's you know, essentially what we're getting at. There are alternatives um, in, in terms of uh, removal to deportation, waivers, asylum, humanitarian parole. We like to consider those um, you know, sort of secondary options for remaining in the United States um, because really uh, all individuals should look toward non-immigrant visa options um, and immigrant visa options as their primary way to remain in the United States. Once you get into um, the more humanitarian forms of parole and relief um, and deportation proceedings or removal proceedings, um, then you're then you're you know talking about much more complicated um, methods of remaining in the United States. Um, so so principally, you should always keep an eye out on whether or not you have any non-immigrant visa options that are available to you, and if you do want to remain in the United States permanently, um, whether there are non-immigrant visa options available to you. Um, we will sort of generically cover the employment-based visa options in this um, presentation, but the majority of the presentation is geared toward the immigrant visa option, the second bullet point on this slide. Okay. So, um, we can, uh, can kind of cover, you know, the, the basics of the non-immigrant visa options, um, when, you know, when one spouse is a U.S. citizen or a green card holder. Um, if you are a part of a binational uh, couple and you want to come to the U.S., but like we said earlier, you have a U.S. citizen spouse or um, a U.S. Um, excuse me, a spouse who's in the U.S. currently, um, you will need to be able to establish, but for having that person in the U.S., your actual intent is temporary. Um, if you're entering via the visa waiver program, uh, that is through the ESTA system. Um, and if you have specific questions about ESTA visa waiver, uh, we have a, a previous webinar you can check out, or you could email either Adam and I about that. But in general, under the visa waiver program, you're admitted for up to 90 days. And if there is no immediate relative immigrant uh, visa petition possible for you. Um, there's not really any other means by which you can adjust status in the U.S. Um, you know, in the, in the same context, there are a few exceptions, but in general, you cannot change to other statuses uh, from visa waiver in practice. Um, so it's a very limited system that requires you to have single intent, temporary intent, to depart the U.S. after your short uh, um, visit to the U.S. For, for business or pleasure. Um, you have to demonstrate you have a residence abroad, you have no intent of abandoning, and in particular that should be emphasized if you're coming to the U.S. and you have a U.S. citizen spouse in the U.S. or otherwise a spouse in the U.S. Um, that would be otherwise a big red flag saying that you have an immigrant intent. Similar with the single intent visas like the B-1, B-2, the F-1, the J-1, uh, the H-3, uh, and so on and so forth, these visas all require you to have the intent to depart the U.S. upon completion of the purpose that you're coming for. Um, there's the, the other dual intent visas, which allow you to explicitly have the temporary intent to be in the U.S. for your specific purpose, but also the long-term, more abstract intent to potentially immigrate in the U.S. or potentially stay here. Uh, in particular, two that are authorized 
uh, for this dual intent, H1B and the L visas. Uh, these ones have a specific provision built in which allow you to um, have the more long-term abstract intent to want to remain in the U.S. and or become a permanent resident eventually. Um, that means that if you are coming to the U.S. on an H-1B and you have a U.S. citizen spouse in the U.S., um, you don't have that line of questioning you otherwise would about you know, establishing you absolutely will depart the U.S. afterwards. Um, to a lesser extent the, than the H and the L, you have the O um, or the E2 or the P, for example, um, which uh, don't require the same level of um, evidence of your residence abroad that you have no intent of abandoning uh, whenever you enter, but you still have some you know, notion and some responsibility to establish to the satisfaction of the officer that you have an intent to depart after the temporary nature of your entry. Um, also, just keep in mind here, you know, there's the non-immigrant um, immigrant visa <laughs> that is the K-1. The K-1 is a fiancé visa, and it is a visa, it's, a, it's, it's in the non-immigrant visa category, but really it's an immigrant short-term visa allowing you to enter um, as the fiancé of a U.S. citizen uh, to marry that that person in the United States within 90 days of your entry. Obviously, because of DOMA, that is not going to be uh, recognized for immigration purposes. You can file to have that intent, but within 90 days, um, you you wish to marry this person. You, you know, as a as a fiance of a U.S. citizen spouse, um, it's unlikely that that petition would be approved for you. Um, and similar to the same reasons that the I-130 would not be able to be approved for you. Um, but also I wanted to briefly mention in here about overstays and the effects of overstays uh, in these specific three categories here. Uh, the visa waiver program, if you overstay um, that, you are no longer eligible to participate in ESTA and you'll require a B-1 or B-2 visa endorsed in your passport should you um, need to come back to the U.S. for whatever reason afterwards. If you overstay a single intent visa like a B-1 or B-2 or an F-1 or something similar, um, then you would be accruing unlawful presence, uh, for example, for a B-1, B-2, the day after the expiration date of your I-94 arrival departure record. Um, if you accrue up to 180 days of unlawful presence, um, you're at risk for, and depart the U.S., you're at risk for subjecting yourself to a three-year bar to ever re-entering, and if you accrue a year more and subsequently depart the U.S. of unlawful presence, then you are subjecting yourself to a uh, tenure bar to re-entry. For the F-1, similarly, at the end of your program, um, you have a 60-day grace period um, that your DS continues. And if you overstay by that um, and someone makes a determination somewhere down the line that you have uh, begun to accrue unlawful presence, um, which would re you know, require that affirmative decision that you've been accruing unlawful presence, but nonetheless, there's a risk um, that if you overstay after the 60-day grace period, you would be subject to these bars if you accrued enough unlawful presence and left. So, um, you know, individuals who are trying to find ways to the U.S. Um, in light of this DOMA potential decision, and again, it's so potential we don't we don't know. You know, keep in mind that there's a lot of risks involved with um, trying to enter in the visa waiver program or single intent visas and accruing unlawful presence. And then, if you know there's no decision, there's a problem um, down the road. We'll we'll go over this a little bit more. But and I mentioned and alluded to it earlier for the immigrant um, adjustment of status process or immigrant visa process, there's two important, you know, to kind of takeaways of, of o between overstays and or just using them in general. Number one, um, an immigrant visa petition and adjustment of status filed for someone who is in the U.S. and had overstayed uh, a visa, for example, as a B-1 or a visa waiver, 
um, is still eligible to adjust status within the U.S., um, but it's discretionary, and they would have to otherwise convince the interviewing officer um, that everything else is on the up and up. Um, you know, it's a, it's a they look at everything together on a case by case basis to to ensure that every you know that the person is otherwise admissible and uh, you know will not become a, a problem or didn't try to evade the immigration laws in any way. Um, you know, there's also a consideration of the 30, 60 day rule where an immigration officer can, or rather will, presume that, an, you know, adjustment of status or otherwise taking up residence or, you know, getting married and taking up residence in the U.S. within the first 30 days of entering in a visa, either visa waiver or uh, a single intent visa, um, and then, you know, maybe applies to adjust status within those first 30 days, they, they'll presume that this was a fraudulent entry, that they um, had ill intent when they entered. This is a rebuttable presumption, but nonetheless one to be aware of. And um, also, the, within 60 days, they won't absolutely, um, you know, consider, or rather, the, the, no presumption that this was a fraudulent or misrepresentation upon entry um, will occur. But they, if, in light of any other circumstances, um, they have some kind of reasonable belief that there was a misrepresentation initially about what you intended when you entered, they can request uh, you know, any countervailing evidence of, of that during the interview process or during a request for evidence. So that's something just you know, important that I wanted to cover. Uh, kind of answers the question that one individual had previously. Um, also, non-immigrant visa options. I, I kind of spoke over, the, over this already, so I'll just go through it quickly. Um, if both spouses, um, you know, in light of DOMA, both spouses would otherwise have to qualify independently for visas um, if they're a dual foreign national couple. But if the B visa um, is an option for someone who's coming with um, someone on a non-immigrant visa, for example, a same-sex spouse of an L1A can get an L2 visa, or excuse me, cannot get an L2 visa, um, but would be able to get the B2 uh, cohabitating partner carve out for that. Um, so you can get six months or a year entry. Um, you, whenever you apply for the B1, B2 visa in this category, you have to explicitly request that the visa office um, at the consulate or embassy annotate the visa properly, just say B2 in lieu of L2 or B2 in lieu of H4 um, to a company, H1B or something similar. Uh, that way, that whenever you apply for entry to the U.S., instead of saying, or rather, instead of guaranteeing yourself no more than six months, you may be eligible to receive up to one year initially. Um, you know, they don't have to issue the one year initial, but um, at the, at the it, more often than not, they give you six months, and then you extend it in six months increments. You know, that is a disadvantage to, to opposite sex spouses who are able to get the L2, uh, which is, you know, valid for up to three years um, and can be extended along with the principal applicant as long as the principal is still there. The L2 also can get work authorization, whereas the B2 cannot. Um, so that's another disadvantage for uh, dual foreign national same-sex couples coming to the U.S. Um, so I'm going to turn it back over to Adam uh, to talk about immigrant visa options. Okay, great. And just in the way um, of an explanation, we've been using a couple of terms that I just quickly wanted to go over and define for everybody so we're all talking the same language. Um, we've been using the term adjustment of status pretty liberally. And um, an adjustment of status is just a shorthand for when uh, somebody who's inside the, who's come to the United States um, on a non-immigrant visa changes their status, well, adjusts their status, I should say, to that of um, an immigrant visa. So it's when you go from non-immigrant visa to immigrant visa. Um, a change of status, which you may have also heard, is when uh, an individual goes from one category of non-immigrant visa to another category of non-immigrant visa. Um, so that would be like if you're going from an F visa, a student visa, to an H-1B visa or a specialty occupation visa, 
or um, the third category is an extension of status, and that's when you're remaining on the same uh, non-immigrant visa category. So that would be, let's say you're on an H-1B and you file for your second H-1B, that's an extension of status. Um, so principally here what we're talking about are adjustment of statuses, and that's when an individual enters the United States on a non-immigrant visa and they've been lawfully inspected. Um, with the minor exception of the visa waiver program, and then um, goes from that non-immigrant visa category to an immigrant visa category, or a green card. Um, and so the immigrant visa options essentially are divided into two categories, um, well with you know a couple of exceptions, but uh, generally they're, um, they're family-based options and employment-based options. And the employment-based options, um, I would encourage people to consider these as well because oftentimes um, the family-based options, you know, feel uh, read readily uh, prevalent and available. But employment-based options are available as well, um, and uh, plenty of people are obtaining green cards on employment-based options. So don't consider uh, the the family-based options your only option, and you should explore all options and you know, consult with an immigration attorney and try and get creative. Um, so employment-based options generically cover uh, people who have extraordinary ability, people who are ex out outstanding professors and researchers, people who are multinational executives or managers, people whose uh, work is in the national interest and can obtain a national interest waiver, uh, and then people who go through the uh, PERM-based um, you know, visa process, uh, which is when your employer sponsors you from either um, you know, your H-1B if you have a, a bachelor's degree or a master's degree. Um, there are also different investment-based opportunities. People who are familiar with this um, visa category, it's often referred to in the shorthand as an EB-5. Um, there's a non-immigrant version um, of that, which is called the investor's visa, and your country of nationality or the nationality of the principal investor has to have a treaty with the United States, but that's not the case for the green card petition, um, and those are called EB-5s under shorthand, and essentially you have to invest um, either $500,000 in an economically depressed area or a regional center, or um, $1 million, and you have to, if it's not uh, in an economically depressed area or a regional center, and create 10 jobs for U.S. workers, and you're subject to the conditions of a green card that um, a newly married uh, couple would be uh, subject to. So it's a conditional green card that you get that you have to apply to remove those conditions after a two-year period. Um, people are also probably familiar with the DV lottery, the diversity visa lottery, which um, is potentially under the acts in the new Senate immigration reform bill. Um, if you've already applied for the diversity visa lottery, uh, winners have been notified. So you should check your case status on the Department of State's website to see if you're like one of the lucky um, winners, and if you are, you should certainly contact an immigration attorney. Um, we have a blog post on our website about the ways that you can maximize your winning lottery number to make sure that that lottery number turns into a green card. Because essentially what you should know if you have won the DV lottery is that there are 120,000 winners and only about 40,000 green cards. So um, it's sort of a race to the finish if you have been notified that you're a winner of the DV lottery. And if that's the case, um, you should certainly contact myself or uh, my colleague Joseph so we can help you make sure that you do turn that um, winning lottery number into a green card. Okay, and um, just briefly again, um, there's an evolving landscape in terms of um, different ways that uh, same-sex couples and their relationships will be treated. Um, thank you for forwarding the slide. Under removal or deportation proceedings, there are different defenses and different waivers that are available, um, and a lot of those are based on a qualifying relationship to a U.S. citizen relative or a U.S. citizen spouse, um, which is primarily the case. Um, U.S. citizen children are also um, considered for the purposes of these waivers, so don't discount any U.S. citizen children that you may have. Um, but for a lot of people, um, you know, principally, we're looking at U.S. citizen spouses. Um, one, you know, case of interest is matter of Dorman, um, which is a, a recent case, um, you know, that essentially has um, has implications for removal proceedings for individuals and cancellation of removal, um, and it also is is sort of interesting to those of us who follow this stuff because um, the case was based on a civil union out of New Jersey, which is, you know, considered a sort of less than marriage status, and so it's very interesting to see if that, 
you know, if um, for the purposes of the cancellation of removal claim, if that um, civil union will be treated the same as marriages. But um, but it's a little bit um, you know in the weeds. So uh, I just wanted to you know draw your attention to it. Um, you know, further um, in removal proceedings. Um, there are, you know, ways that you can apply for humanitarian relief. Um, principally, those categories are asylum, withholding of removal, and CAT relief, which is shorthand for the uh, relief under the Convention Against Torture. Um, and uh, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with some of this stuff, um, so I'm just going to, again, cover it briefly. But uh, you are eligible to apply for asylum on the basis of your sexual orientation, uh, you know, since 1994. Um, asylum requires that you've suffered harm rising to the level of, past, of persecution, and that that persecution you've, you've either suffered in the past, or that you have a reasonable, uh, excuse me, that you have a well-founded fear of future persecution. Um, there are essentially five categories under which you can apply for asylum in the United States. It's race, religion, nationality, political opinion, and particular social group. Particular social group is a sort of catch-all category, and it's the one that uh, sexual orientation now currently exists under. And um, you know, to a certain extent, transgender and HIV-positive individuals have also had, uh, you know, uh, have eligibility to uh, receive asylum in the United States based on their own, you know, um, membership in a particular social group, separate and distinct from that of those who are applying on the basis of their sexual orientation. The case law around transgender and HIV positive individuals is a little bit less clear. Um, so uh, if you are considering applying for uh, asylum, I would certainly suggest that you contact an attorney. Um, if you have suffered past persecution, um, you know, that, that is more favorable in terms of your asylum claim. A well-founded fear of future persecution claim is a little bit more difficult claim to make and typically requires that there are some laws on the books forbidding um, the activity. Um, so if that's um, laws forbidding, um, you know, um, uh, same-sex relationships or same-sex um, sex, uh, then, you know, that, that, would, that, that would be a favorable indicator for a well-founded fear claim. Um, but essentially, um, if you're thinking about asylum, you should certainly contact um, a, a legal professional and a qualified immigration attorney who deals exclusively or um, primarily with immigration law because it is a unique set of laws. Um, and on to reform. So uh, I, I'm sure a lot of people have been following, um, but just to recap, um, there is a Senate immigration bill that has been proposed um, that would essentially entirely overhaul the U.S. immigration system as we know it. Um, there are a group of eight senators um, who have called themselves the Gang of Eight who are moving forward on immigration reform and they um, have pledged to one another that they will remain lockstep uh, in their political beliefs um, so that immigration reform can pass. Um, sacrificed on the altar of the Gang of Eight seems to be uh, any consideration of including same-sex marriages within the larger immigration package. Um, the Uniting American Families Act has been separately introduced in both the House and the Senate um, and was, um, by all indications, um, to be included in the larger immigration bill until um, this, you know, until the Gang of Eight essentially got a hold of it um, and determined that we're back in 1996, and pardon my um, you know, pardon my sense of humor about this, but um, but they've decided that it would derail immigration reform, and so um, the same-sex um, inclusion provisions are not uh, as are not currently a part of the comprehensive immigration reform package. Senator Leahy, who's the chief sponsor of the Senate Immigration um, of the Senate Uniting American Families Act bill, um, has has introduced two separate amendments to the um, to the immigration reform bill. And um, the shorthand for the bill's name is um, Bessimioma or something like that. A lot of people are calling it Bessie May, but I'm just going to call it the Comprehensive Immigration Reform Bill and just know that I'm talking about the Senate bill because there is no House bill at this point. Um, so there are two, uh, two amendments that have been introduced. One is a straight up um, you know, copy of the Uniting American Families Act. Uh, which is self-defining. It defines same-sex relationships in terms of um, qualifying permanent partnerships and then outlines what you need to um, have in order to qualify for a permanent partner. 
and that is essentially an end around um, for DOMA. So it wouldn't be implicated under DOMA if DOMA were to stand. There's a separate amendment, which is essentially a DOMA carve-out, um, which would, um, would, instead of attacking DOMA straight on, just carves out um, a same-sex exception under the immigration bill. So it would say, you know, it would sort of keep DOMA in effect except for its immigration consequences. And so we've referred to it here on this slide as the Equal Protection Amendment, and it's a carve-out exception to DOMA uh, uniquely for the immigration context. So those are the two different ways um, legislatively that, um, that the issue is being addressed. Uh, immigration equality is taking the lead on that, so I would refer any um, particular questions as to the um, likelihood of those amendments succeeding and any of the political repercussions of that to immigration equality. Um, they've done, you know, yeoman's work in getting the amendments introduced. Um, the, the current status of that is that they have been introduced in the Judiciary Committee. They have not been voted on or reported out of committee, so they are sort of remain in limbo. And um, our, as we have been on this webinar, the Senate Judiciary Committee has now recessed and adjourned um, for the weekend. So it looks like no further action will be taken this week uh, on any amendments to the Senate Immigration Bill. So this um, will remain, these two amendments will remain sort of pending um, until there is either an up or down vote in the Judiciary Committee or until um, you know, all of uh, the amendments have been um, cleared through the Judiciary Committee. So that's the legislative process. Um, what happens um, when um, recognition, when DOMA is struck down? Um, this is probably what everybody's on this phone call uh, for. And so um, our big answer is, um, you know, I don't want to bury the lead here, but essentially the big answer is we're, we're not entirely sure. Um, we can tell you what we think. We can tell you what we know. Um, but anybody who tells you what's going to happen um, is trying to sell you something right now. So um, essentially, our, our best advice is um, to, to hold steady. Um, we, don't, we think it's premature in order to file for um, an I-130 um, for the reasons, or for a fiancé visa for the reasons that Joseph um, earlier described. Um, we also think that any current entries under the B visa program or ESTA program in anticipation of DOMA falling, uh, not only run the risk of um, having uh, committed visa fraud um, for, you know, for a violation of their primary purpose of their intent, but also if the DOMA case does drag out, you risk overstaying um, ESTA, which would mean that you would no longer be eligible for the program, or um, you know, if you're on a B visa, then you're talking about overstaying and potential inadmissibility. So for these reasons, um, and um, many of you have waited 10 years and are, or more, or 40, you know, and are sick and tired of waiting, and we totally understand that. Um, but our, our conservative advice is, is to protect you and to protect your interests. And so we do strongly urge that you, um, you know, that you proceed with caution, um, that you prepare, you know, documents perhaps in advance of um, DOMA falling. Um, and um, if you know, for those who are not married and are thinking about getting married, um, there's no adverse uh, implications of actually getting married, um, except for the ones that um, that my colleague Joseph talked about in terms of you know entering the United States and having to report that. So we would like to talk to you about that in specificity if you're in that situation. Um, but um, but that's the situation that we're in. Um, in terms of the Supreme Court. Um, we can give you just sort of a shorthand overview. Um, there, are, you know, many of you are following this, and so pardon for the rehash if you are. Um, but for those who haven't been following the cases so closely, um, the Supreme Court earlier in its term heard two different separate challenges to the Federal Defense of Marriage Act. Um, one through the Proposition 8 case, which is um, Hollingsworth v. Perry, um, which you know is so specific really to the the legal situation in California where marriages were uh, conferred, and then um, through, um, through a popular vote referendum were then um, withdrawn. Um, and that appeal has gone forward to, um, to the Supreme Court um, on that particular issue of whether or not it's a uh, violation of equal protect protection, essentially, to, um, you know, to have these marriages recognized by the state and then withdraw them based on a popular referendum. 
um, the you know sort of um, the uh, the betting man's um, um, prediction on the prop eight case um, is that it's not looking as strong a case in terms of a, a, a doma challenge and uh, fundamentally a doma overturn as is the Windsor case. Um, people are you know legal scholars are discussing some of the difficult issues with the standing in the um, in the Prop 8 case, and essentially that's um, a procedural issue that may not, or that may prevent, or may allow the uh, Supreme Court justices to not address the merits of the Prop 8 case. Um, if they do, um, you know, if if the um, if the Prop 8 case is decided on standing grounds, and the Supreme Court decides that there is no standing, um, then the implications of that are not going to be widespread. Um, they will likely be, um, you know, contained to California, and ca and marriages in California will likely be recognized if um, if it's decided um, that there's no standing on the Prop 8 case. Um, quickly turning to the Windsor case, um, that's a case um, um, concerning, um, you know, federal um, tax benefits for same-sex spouses, um, and this case looks to be on better ground in terms of its overall uh, repercussions for DOMA. Um, it does itself have uh, particular standing questions, procedural questions relating to whether or not there's an injury suffered, um, but um, but it looks to be on better standing grounds, and it looks like if um, if there is going to be um, you know if DOMA is going to be struck down, um, it looks like it's going to be through the Windsor case. Um, it, oral arguments indicated that there are two separate ways for the Supreme Court to strike down DOMA based on the Windsor case. Um, step or you know, sort of um, the, the the first way that that um, the Windsor case could be struck down is on equal protection grounds, um, which essentially just says that you can't treat one class of uh, individuals or category of people separately and differently from another based on you know based on animus essentially. Um, and it doesn't look like there were enough justices on the Supreme Court to take the equal protection grounds to overturning DOMA um, based on the Windsor case. Um, what looks more likely, and as Justice Kennedy being the fifth swing vote, um, particularly because his line of questioning um, asked, you know, was, was focused on uh, states' rights, it looks like um, if they are going to overturn DOMA, they're going to do so on Tenth Amendment or states' rights um, grounds. Um, essentially, the short of this very long analysis is that um, any way they overturn DOMA would be good for immigration purposes because it is federal. Um, if they overturn it on state uh, rights grounds or Tenth Amendment grounds, there are some questions about jurisdiction um, and what would happen in a jurisdiction, say, like Alabama, that has a mini DOMA in place um, where individuals were married in New York but are currently residing in, New York was just an example, but are currently residing in Alabama, you know, which state, um, which state's law take um, preference, essentially. Um, and my colleague will cover that. But um, but if it is struck down on Tenth Amendment grounds, then um, you know then we're in sort of uncharted legal waters, and we think we have the answer for you. We're going to present the answer that we think we have, and that leading scout, leading scholars on this matter are um, you know have are, are, are arguing is how the um, overturn of DOMA will be enforced in the immigration context. So um, Joseph, I think that's that's my cue to turn it over to you and. Cheers. Go for it. So, like um, like Adam said, in the event that you know the DOMA decision at the Supreme Court comes out as striking DOMA down based on and including or including an analysis of um, specific states' rights issues, um, including perhaps the Tenth Amendment, including perhaps um, the laws regarding marriage recognition in general, um, and or taking into consideration any favorable unfavorable or even um, relevant discussion of the ability of states to determine whether or not they will recognize a out-of-state same-sex marriage uh, arising from the Prop 8 case. Um, you know, we may see a landscape where we have a return to, um, you know, the traditional immigration law um, view of marriage recognition. And as a re review, that is, the marriage has to be valid where performed. The law of the place of celebration controls. The marriage has to not be um, have been entered into in bad faith, 
and it's not contrary to the public policy in the state where the couple resides or intends to reside. And that is the key. That third point is the key in uh, this outcome we're talking about in, if the Supreme Court strikes down DOMA um, inclusive of this, a state's rights analysis uh, or with, uh, based on states' rights. Um, in that case, um, whether or not a same-sex marriage ban is strong enough public policy to warrant non-recognition of the marriage on a federal level, specifically for federal immigration purposes, um, is kind of an uncharted you know, landscape or uncharted waters for um, this purpose. But you know, based on what you know, we've been um, hearing and, and what we think and uh, where it could possibly go, it's unlikely that any state laws, um, in particular, specifically law that would ban a recognition of a same-sex marriage performed out of state would be strong enough public policy. Um, however, there's another question of whether or not a state constitutional amendment or mini-DOMA um, would be strong enough. That might hinge upon the results and the scope of, a, uh, of the Prop 8 case, for example, which likely will be limited to California um, if not simply just because of standing. Um, and also I just want to mention before I go through each of the three points in more detail that um, you know civil unions and anything less than marriage uh, and anything less than marriage is uh, is uncertain for immigration purposes. This is particular analysis directed towards marriage, not domestic partnerships, not civil unions, not anything else. So for our first point, the marriage has to be valid where performed. As of today, we have 12 countries that um, perform same-sex, or rather allow and recognize the performance of same-sex marriages within their jurisdictions. Um, they're listed here. We've added Brazil to this list from uh, the past couple of days. Um, as of now, there are 12 US states. I believe it's about 17% of the US population lives in a state where same-sex marriages are valid, uh, validly performed. There's also two North American capital districts, the District of Columbia in the US and Mexico City in Mexico, where same-sex marriages may be validly performed. Uh, not bad faith argument, fairly straightforward. It can't be a fraudulent marriage. This has always been the case in immigration. Um, that's why we have the marriage uh, interviews for, for a point. That's why we have the 751 removal of the conditions for uh, marriages, um, for marriage-based green cards. Uh, you cannot enter into the marriage solely for immigration purposes. And, um, you know, there's, uh, there is a special consideration for individuals or one, or rather for, for marriages within which one of the spouses identifies as bisexual, um, being able to demonstrate um, that, that it was not bad faith uh, for their purposes, um, you know, some officers, you know, have not had the sufficient training in this, but just to be sure and just to be safe, um, spouses in parties to a marriage where one identifies as bisexual um, should, you know, take special considerations of establishing um, their, their good faith in entering to the marriage and that it's not fraudulent and uh, you know, speak with a qualified immigration attorney who has had some experience with those types of cases. Um, and then the most important of the three, as I mentioned earlier, not contrary to public policy. So it can't be strong enough public policy um, in the state of residence or intended residence. Um, that would, if it was strong enough public policy, um, rather if there was some, some ban of recognition of out-of-state same-sex marriages um, that rose to a level that would be considered strong enough public policy to warrant non-federal recognition. Um, in the past, the Supreme Court has held, and the courts generally follow, that the, a type of marriage that would be strong enough public policy, or rather a type of law that would be strong enough public policy to warrant non-recognition of the marriage for federal purposes um, has been 
usually limited to marriages that would otherwise be criminal, uh, a criminal law prohibiting a type of marriage, for example, um, between, say, siblings or a father and a child. Um, those are the types of criminal laws that arise too strong in a public policy um, so far that have that have ever you know risen in the courts. As of right now, um, there are no thank goodness of laws that are criminalized same-sex marriages. Um, we have, and I'll get into this momentarily, but we have some states with constitutional amendments banning recognition of out-of-state same-sex marriages. We have six states with state laws banning recognition of out-of-state same-sex marriages. Um, in particular, New Mexico doesn't have a law either way, but in practice and uh, based on some recent you know, local or um, municipal decisions, uh, New Mexico, for practical purposes, recognizes out-of-state same-sex marriages. Um, New Jersey, which does have civil unions, um, is, in, but not specifically marriage, um, they don't have a restriction or a ban on recognition of same-sex marriages performed out of state. Um, it's a rather unique, unique uh, state in this instance. And right now, the movement towards marriage equality there um, is something that many of you are following. But um, we, we still have a promise to veto any bill of, that would be further coming from the legislature there by the governor. Um, but, you know, that may be subject to change in the near term. We have 30 states with constitutional amendments restricting marriage uh, to heterosexual couples. And these are the states that are at issue here. Whether or not a constitutional amendment restricting marriage uh, to opposite sex couples arises to strong enough public policy to warrant non-recognition of a same-sex marriage for federal immigration purposes is an untested area of the law. Now, this would really only come up and be a problem, we think, if the DOMA decision is ruled upon or includes a heavy analysis of uh, states' rights issues and there was perhaps an unfavorable um, or ambiguous decision in the Prop 8 case, which is directly on point to whether or not a constitutional amendment um, restricting marriage to heterosexual couples, in a way, is, um, is valid. You know, that, that case, like Adam said, is more specifically about whether or not that can be take, that right given to uh, the populace can be taken away by popular vote. Um, but at the same time, it, it will potentially include language on the relevance uh, of direct relevance to this to this matter. Um, that being said, also in practice, um, and the reason I, I spoke about the transgender marriages previously, um, in addition to it just being an interesting point of fact, is that um, for USCIS and for the government's um, interpretation and recognition of transgender marriages, under which is based upon um, the law of marriage recognition and the immigration context in general have not found laws in states that ban recognition of transgender marriages um, to be strong enough public policy to warrant non-recognition. And I think that's important um, to think about. That means that this administration, um, at least the USCIS under this administration, is not taking the policy that uh, state laws banning recognition of transgender marriages are strong enough public policy warranting non-recognition. Um, so that's, that's an important consideration to, to consider. Uh, the six laws that have, or excuse me, the six states that still have laws restricting marriage to heterosexual couples um, but not constitutional amendments, which would be important in this limited circumstance, uh, include Hawaii, Illinois, Indiana, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Wyoming. So it, what this really, really boils down to is individuals who, or rather couples, who live in those 30 states with constitutional amendments um, may have, may, we don't know. We are just giving you our best guess based on a potential outcome of the Supreme Court case 
no one will really know for sure what will happen until that happens, until the decision comes out. But um, you know, these individuals who live in these states may have to run into potential problems down the road or potential complications if a policy change occurs um, and or an, an untrained or um, potentially uninformed or <laughs> potentially um, bad, for lack of a better word, uh, USCIS officer declines to approve an I-140 uh, because they believe that that constitutional amendment is strong enough public policy. So I think I've gone on far enough. I think that we will now turn it to uh, some questions and really get into everything that everyone has to say here. Um, so I will go through here and uh, answer any questions that we have. Adam, do you also have access to these questions? Uh, I don't think so. So if you could so, just maybe read them aloud yeah. if you want me to answer them. Sure. So um, we have a question about uh, a clarification question. Uh, if you're on a single intent visa, um, do you have an option of staying in the U.S. if you're married to a U.S. citizen? So I would be happy to answer that question. Um, in general, um, you, if you're married to a U.S. citizen, and you, their your your marriage is um, will your excuse me your marriage will be recognized for immigration purposes, then they could file an I-130 petition for you. You could uh, adjust status from within the U.S. based on an approved I-130 petition. Um, if you have, uh, or excuse me, you could you could adjust status from within the U.S. if you have an approved I-130 petition for you, um, and you're otherwise admissible. Um, so even if you're here on a single intent visa, um, you do have options for staying in the U.S. if you're married to a U.S. citizen, but keeping in mind that um, you know you have to establish to, to the satisfaction of a consular officer upon entry, excuse me, consular officer upon applying for the visa and a CBP officer upon entry, that your intent is to go to school. And so if that's not the case, then that may not be appropriate. Um, but in general, if you're here and you have been here for three or four years studying and um, you know people fall in love all the time and people get married all the time um, if that happens then um, you know and that then subsequently it changes your intent your intent wasn't fraudulent when you entered um, so um, that's completely um, a normal occurrence in the world and it's something that can absolutely happen so there are absolutely options I don't want to give you the idea that single intent visas um, you know, are absolutely restrictive. Uh, they are, though, restrictive for your purposes of entering the U.S. and um, satisfying, excuse me, establishing to the satisfaction of the officer of your of your intent whenever you enter and that your intent is proper. Okay, let's see. We have um, an asylum question for Adam. Um, what types of evidence does an immigration officer look for to determine whether an individual is persecuted. Um, you mentioned that another country's law would be relevant, but what other evidence might be relevant? Um, that's a great question. Um, unfortunately, there are very little rules of evidence in, um, you know, in immigration law generally, and certainly in asylum proceedings. Um, so I think if you're talking about an affirmative asylum claim, um, you would want to start with the Department of State report. Um, there's heavy weights placed on the Department of State report, and you can find those reports on the um, Department of State's website. If you go under uh, Human Rights, uh, the, the um, you know subsection on their report entitled Human Rights, and then there's a country by country Human Rights report for that um, for for each country essentially that um, that the U.S. has diplomatic relations with and otherwise. Um, I would start there. I would see what the law says because that is going to color uh, the way that an immigration officer or um, an asylum officer or an immigration judge, depending on which uh, you know type of proceeding you're in, will will view your claim. Um, I would say if you're applying for asylum from Japan, um, I would not recommend you do that. Um, no matter how bad the situation is for you personally, um, you know this is uh, all, you know I would. I would caution you against doing that because um, you also have to keep in mind that this is a political world um, and this is a political theater and asylum is a very political institution. So that's why I would recommend starting with the Department of State report. 
Um, other than that, um, any physical evidence of harm or abuse. So um, typically that would look like, um, you know, if you suffered physical harm, any um, medical reports or evidence that you can get to obtain proof of that physical harm um, are, are really good pieces of evidence to submit. If you have photographs of the physical harm that you've suffered, that's really great. Um, and you should be careful when you're submitting evidence about authentication requirements. Uh, under immigration proceedings, typically there's a requirement that you authenticate documents. There's an interesting decision that just came out of the Seventh Circuit really chastising the Board of Immigration Appeals, which is the appellate body once above the immigration judges, um, about their, um, their narrow view of authentication. Um, so I would, I would strongly caution you that all evidence needs to be authenticated if possible. Um, I would be happy to further talk about that with any individual who may be um, thinking about applying for asylum, but just be aware of that. Um, and then, um, you know, short of firsthand evidence and things of that nature, um, you can always submit affidavits. Now, they're probably going to be um, weighted, um, you know, uh, with diminished weight, um, certainly less so than primary evidence. Um, but often, you know, they don't expect um, asylum applicants in, in many instances to flee their country with proof of the harm that they've suffered. Um, the Real ID Act, which was passed in 2005, does impose a corroboration requirement. Um, to the extent that it's reasonably um, available, that the evidence is reasonably available. So you should make all efforts to corroborate um, the harm that you um, have suffered. Um, and so if that's only in the form of affidavits, then that's only in the form of affidavits. Um, but if you're doing affidavits, again, they have to be authenticated, and that means typically notarized, um, certified in some particular way, or if that's not possible, um, you should at least present the identity documents of the individual who's making the att attestations. Um, so that's just a brief overview of evidence in immigration law. Um, I would also just add that there's no such thing as hearsay in immigration law. Um, well, at, at least not, you know, uh, um, in the shorthand there's not. Um, so evidence is sort of a free-for-all in immigration proceedings, but the more evidence you can present, the better is, um, is the takeaway from this. As a follow-up to that, um, there's a another question regarding asylum. It's a it's not necessarily directly on point, but it was about uh, whether or not people with disabilities can qualify for asylum. Um, I think that you know it would depend on a case by case basis whether or not. I mean, I know there was a recent decision from the Ninth Circuit on point, but uh, you know, case by case basis, this would be a particular social group potential claim, um, but. Uh, since it's not directly on point, we'll skip it. Another question from the same individual, though. Um, if a U.S. and non-U.S. Uh, couple adopt a child together, would the non-U.S. partner become eligible for immigration? Uh, under current law, under, uh, you know, with the Defense of Marriage Act, the non-U.S. spouse, I'm assuming, if it's a married couple, um, still is not eligible to have a, an immediate relative spouse petition filed for them. Um, and in general, even if they have a U.S. citizen child, for example, uh, that child is not able to sponsor them um, until they reach at least uh, a certain age, in, in 21. Um, you know, there's, it's not like you can adopt uh, the, the quote-unquote horrible term that, you know, is actually a misnomer of of having an anchor child in the U.S. or something similar um, that actually doesn't give any immigration benefits um, to having a U.S. citizen child necessarily. Um, but, you know, for purposes of removal um, and relief from removal, if you had an adopt, uh, you know, a U.S. citizen child adopted or legitimated or um, step or biological or however, um, a child would otherwise be defined under the INA. Um, you know, that might be um, helpful in terms of, you know, discretionary forms of relief. Um, we have another question, too. Let's see. If a individual is here on an F-1 visa and they have a U.S. Um, citizen partner but not spouse um, and they are in their 60-day grace period and, and soon um, departing the U.S., are they eligible to come back on a B-1 or B-2 visa? Um, you know, in the short term, if you're here for a long period of time, say on an F, it is 
much more difficult in practice to be able to get a tourist visa um, on that. If you already have a tourist visa, uh, fine. You know, you may have some trouble um, at the border, similar to how I said at the beginning of the presentation, with, um, you know, if you have a U.S. citizen loved one uh, or a loved one in the U.S. that would otherwise indicate to the immigration officer your intent to remain here permanently. Um, the B, just like the F, is a single uh, intent visa. You also have, I have to have a residence abroad. You have no intent of abandoning. Um, and um, now there's a follow-up, too, about whether or not a TN would be possible. Uh, the TN is very similar to those in terms of you have to have the temporary intent. You cannot have the long-term intent. Uh, you have to have a residence abroad. You have no intent of abandoning, showing ties to your home country. Um, so these are the t you would need to show uh, and be prepared to be asked for evidence that you have a residence in Canada that you have no intent of going to. If you're coming here on a B1 or B2, that you have a specific duration uh, in mind, you know, you have a return flight ticket back to your home in Canada um, while you're here. Um, you know, you have, say, a letter from your employer in Canada showing that you're on vacation and you're going back. In general, the B is, is a very, uh, you know, up getting or using the, the tourist visa after being here for an extended period of time on an F or otherwise is somewhat difficult. But also keep in mind that during your grace period, uh, as an F1, it's possible to change status to another non-immigrant status. Um, you can apply to change, for example, to a B2. For, for example, you have to give notice on your lease and things like that. You know, those are the types of evidence that would typically be shown in a request for a change of status from F1 to, say, another category. Otherwise, you can change status directly from your F1 to say, a TN if you have that qualifying employer who uh, files a petition for you or, or prepares the application uh, support letter for you. Um, let's see. There's another question here. Can I just jump in real quick there, too? For all Please. F1 students, um, just um, as, a, as a way to extend status, you should talk to your DSO about using OPT if you haven't done that previously. Um, and if you're you know, mid-curriculum, you might be able to use um, CPT. Um, but certainly, and if you're in the science, um, tech, um, engineering, or mathematic field, um, you may be eligible for a STEM extension. Um, so OPT and STEM extensions are something that you should talk with your schools, um, excuse me, with the DSO about to see if those extensions would um, be possible for you. And they're often a way, an easy and um, cheap and quick way to extend your status. Another question is, uh, if DOMA struck down, would it be beneficial to have a prior domestic partnership with your spouse in terms of obtaining um, PR status, oh, sorry, I can't read that, PR status uh, through marriage? Um, so it's an individual case-by-case -case basis. I wouldn't say that that one couple would have a, a leg up over another couple if they had a domestic partnership before they had a marriage. Um, e the, the officer is looking at, at, you know, if the marriage was valid where performed, if the marriage was entered into in good faith, uh, not bad faith, and uh, there's no strong enough public policy to warrant non-recognition at the federal level um, in the state of residence or intended residence. Um, if you had a previous um, domestic partnership uh, with your spouse, great. You can use that as evidence to show the bona fide nature of the relationship. Um, and that's the type, typical type of evidence you would bring with you to the eventual marriage interview. Um, but otherwise, I don't, I don't think that it necessarily is um, beneficial or hurtful. I think that, uh, you know, it's, it would, you know, each, each individual case is different. And so um, as long as you can show those three bullet points, um, or rather three, you know, important considerations, it's, it's, it's for the best. And for a, for a marriage that's, um, uh, you know, uh, younger than two years, you would still be subject to the conditional green card. And there's no, there's no evidence or there's no, uh, I think there's very little argument even that a prior existing um, partnership or, um, you know, civil union um, would be, um, would allow you to not have the conditional green card. Do you, do you agree with that, Joseph? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. I also, um, we have one last question here. If the Supreme Court rules against DOMA, 
uh, what happens next? Can same-sex couples start filing the next day? Great question. <laughs> um, I, I would say, um, a, you know, first, what the Supreme Court's going to do is anyone's guess. Uh, you know, they could, they could make a decision broadly, um, which would allow, yes, filings the next day. Um, you know, as soon as, it's, it's, as soon as Section 3 of DOMA is ruled unconstitutional, however it's ruled unconstitutional, um, DOMA is no longer the law of the land. And uh, for, you know, our best guess of, of the results coming out of that decision um, and as a result of that decision is that we return to traditional definition and traditional procedure for marriage recognition of federal purposes. Um, I absolutely uh, think that we can start filing the next day when Section 3 is taken down, but with the caveat that depending on what's in the decision and how it was reached, if it involves the state's rights issue, uh, for those individuals residing in the, the states with constitutional amendments, um, you know, I would say that those individuals in particular should be warned of and should be advised by immigration attorneys of you know, the very potential, however unlikely, depending on the expert um, or attorney that you talk to uh, who have been studying this issue and discussing and debating this issue, um, you know, that, they should, that clients should still be advised nonetheless of a possibility of you know, the, the rogue officer who is, who is against um, you know, or who finds those constitutional amendments strong enough public policy to warrant non-recognition. Um, but at the same time, it's not a criminal law. It's, um, it's, it's in practice under this administration, at least in the transgender marriage um, realm, is not, or rather, the laws have not been considered strong enough public policy. So I would say, um, this, <laughs> what can happen next? Same-sex couples should start consulting with qualified immigration attorneys the next day. Yeah, and I would agree with that. I would say, too, we'd be looking for um, some sort of directive or policy memorandum from administration officials, um, and that, um, you know, that um, if, if you did want to go forward on day, you know, day two or day one after DOMA's fall, um, you should just be aware that you're still, in some cases, going to be considered a test case. Um, and um, that, that it's sort of the great unknown, that there's no obstacle in the way of processing I-130s, but, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean smooth sailing. Um, so uh, as my colleague said, it's, it's best to go through with an attorney if possible. And if not, um, just know that it may be a bumpy ride. Um, and it, it may not be the kind of race that you want to finish first in. <laughs> Well, thank you all very much for your questions, and thank you all for attending this, this webinar. Um, Adam and I will be back um, in a few months, or maybe even less, once the Supreme Court makes a decision. Please also check out our, our uh, firm's blog for articles by either Adam or myself on point. And uh, you know, check out, like we also mentioned, Immigration Equality's website. They have some great information there about the potential and proposed legislation and amendments. And uh, thank you very much for attending, and everyone, please have a great week.